The Focus of Freedom, from the Freedom Tabernacle Baptist Church and Freedom Tabernacle Ministries in Atkins, Virginia. Home of Camp Freedom, a regional outreach to our youth. Freedom House, offering counseling, intervention, emergency shelter, and food distribution. And with our many missionary partners, reaching out around the world with the light and love of the gospel of Christ. And now, the focus of freedom. So upon the infallible, eternal, undeniable word of God I stand. As always, thanks for watching tonight. We appreciate you being there. We really, truly do. As you see in the background here, the new facility that we've been in now for about a month. And uh, thank you. And above all, thank the Lord. Now we do have some more work to do. We're standing here in the balcony. We got to get the balcony carpeting in and the seating here, the uh, communion chapel, uh, that's priority. Uh, all the flooring in the classrooms, got to do that. And then we've got some stuff to do outside as well. But before we do that, we've got to finish up this extensive sound uh, system and all the lighting system. Uh, this is extensive in this venue. And those of you who have been here, you know just how much God has blessed this facility. For all the folks in this region, uh, for Christian productions, conferences, all kinds of things. And coming up next on March 15th and 16th, that's Easter weekend, the Easter play, Can He Hear Me? That's the title. So pastors, youth pastors, senior citizen directors, everybody, family groups, church groups, make your plans now. You've only got just a little over a month and uh, we're going to be having this year's Easter production. Now we hope and pray that all the sound and lighting all in, all done by then, Lord willing, uh, even perhaps uh, many other things finished inside here by Easter, and then we will be concentrating, turning our attention on the parking lot lights and this parking area uh, finished up outside. Well, to God be all glory. He's blessed us over these seven and a half years. Uh, it was, it's, it's been a long journey, but we're here, and God is amazingly blessing. And you just keep on doing what you've been doing. I'll keep on doing what I've been doing and laboring together with the Lord. Let's finish up now these next few weeks doing all we can do financially, prayerfully, and then especially all the local folks here at the church that work so hard and give their time and effort in everything we do here. And we just thank the Lord. Pray for us here at Freedom Tabernacle Ministries as we enter into the spring, of course, always getting ready for the summer, for the summer camps, and for all the local folks. E-Camp, God willing, is coming back uh, this summer through the summer. So all of you who took advantage of that ministry, and I believe God richly blessed that last summer. Everyone does. And do that again here before too long, hopefully right after Easter, uh, we'll be starting E-Camps every Sunday and all kinds of ministries on Sunday evening. Evening. Pray for us here at Freedom and let's finish this thing up now and plan to be with us on Easter 15th and 16th. Remember that title, Can He Hear Me? I'm telling you, uh, He can hear you. Uh, he loves you no matter what shape you're in, no matter what you're going through. And we're very conscious here on the Focus of Freedom that many of you are struggling in various ways sickness, sorrow, stress, strain, burdens, battles, all kinds of stuff. I don't need to go through a whole list of potential and possible scenarios. If you're hurting tonight, the Lord knows. He's right there where you are. Sadly, a lot of folks don't know the Lord, so they readily and speedily criticize Him. Why do little children suffer? Why are do, are do catastrophes happen? Why are all these negatives? Folks that don't know the Lord don't understand Him, but we who know Him, we know He's at His best when life is at its worst. We're going to be talking about the fact that we don't have to fear because the Lord is near through every storm, through every trial, through the high winds and the, and the horrible waves. Jesus is there in the storm with us. 
He walks on troubled waters to comfort his people and to be with his people. We're talking about not. That's the title, I guess, of this little series, beginning in Psalms 37. Fret not, forget not, because God assures us that he will forsake not. And because he will never forsake, the one who says, I will forsake not, therefore we can fear not. And ultimately and eternally with the Lord, we'll fail not. So an interesting little uh, sermon series here on the simple little word, not. And we've been, we're going to be talking about five of them by the time we get finished. And tonight, here on the Focus of Freedom, from this morning's message, fear not. The Savior's with you in your storm. He's right there where you are. And we can eventually stop struggling with it and start sleeping through it. We'll hear all about that in tonight's message. Heavenly Father, Bless this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom to all of our hearts in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching. Now check the, the website, ftministries.org, for a few little revival schedules. You can do that and find out about that. But enough said. Let's go now to this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom.
talking about these whatnots. You know, somebody says, pretty day, they say, what a day. Uh, you know, or what this, what that kind of for emphasis. So let's just kind of title this three or four Sunday series here, What Nots, What Nots, Psalms 37. And uh, let's just reverence the word of the Lord here before we pray. Psalms 37 and verse one, and look at it there in your Bibles. And this is the first knot, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Just trust in the Lord and rest in the Lord. You don't have to be overly anxious. You don't have to be agitated every day. But trusting in God will lead you to rest in God and so a cessation of unnecessary stress. Fret not. Now, chapter 103, over there we go as we turn the pages of God's Word together. Psalms 103, verse 2. We come to the second knot. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Don't let the Lord that you're trusting in and resting in escape your mind by being replaced by the stresses and strains of this life. Inevitably, we're going to face them, but we don't have to forget God just in the face of our opponents, oppositions, and all the inevitable, unavoidable, inescapable stressors of life. Now, when we forget God, then we're going to fret. But if we forget not, we're more likely to fret not. Now, Let's move on over to chapter 138 and verse 8. Boy, I like that sound. God's Word in God's house, in the hands and hearts of God's people. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Now, what did we say last week? We can better fret not and forget not if we realize to the bottom of our soul and being that God said, I will forsake not. And when we live with that reality that God Almighty said to me and to you, I will never forsake you. I'm not going to leave you. So when it's real to my life that God will forsake not, then I'm better suited to fret not and forget not. And when I really know he ain't never going to leave me, he's always going to be with me. From the cross where he said it's finished, all the way to the city where he's going to cry done, the shepherd of our lives will get us through the valley of the shadow of death. No matter what we face, He's facing it with us. Therefore, we can come to the fourth knot now. Let's turn all the way over to the grand prophecy of Isaiah chapter 43 and read these wondrous words together. Isaiah chapter 43. The waters ain't going to overflow you. His ways in the sea, the troubles and the trials. Now watch this. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. How much more authority do you want than somebody that created everything that is? How much authority is that? Can you fathom that? Your creator, God Almighty, says to you, this fourth not. Fear not. God said, I'll forsake not. Now, if he's going to be with me as a Christian in my heart every day, then I certainly can be a living specimen of one who fears not. God said, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. He purchased you with his own blood. You belong to God, not to the devil. You belong to him, not to this world. 
You are a peculiar people. That means a purchased possession. You belong to him. So therefore, he says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Oh my, look at verse five now. Fear not. Everybody say that. This is the word of the Lord to you. Read it with me, verse five. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. Lord, we don't have to be afraid. You have not given us that old negative spirit of fear and dread, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God, we stand or sit, or in my case, kneel here in your house this morning, and we ask you to deliver your word to your people. And God, our hearts have been concerned all week long for the many, many people that asked for prayer for their soul last Sunday and yet they did not walk these aisles for you. I pray that if they haven't been saved yet, they will be saved today. So speak to all of us, sinner and saved, everybody, from your word to the deep of our heart in Jesus' name. Give us ears to hear and common sense to respond with obedience and faith in the highest, holiest name there is, the name that pleases heaven and scares hell to death, the name of Jesus. To him be honor and glory now and always. Amen and amen. As we sit together here in the sanctuary of our God, may I say again today, there is none higher than him, none holier than him, and he has assured us that he will never leave us and that he will never forsake us. And because he will not forsake his purchased possession. His purchased possession then can honestly fret not if we forget not. God doesn't want you aggravated, agitated, tore up all the time. He doesn't want you overly critical. He doesn't want you hateful in your attitude. God wants you to have the sweetness of salvation surrounded by the walls of salvation and anointed by the very Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. So fret not, forget not, because God will forsake not Therefore, we fear not. Now, there's two usages of the word fear in our Bibles. For example, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and I know during the 830 service, Brother Greg, you quoted that quite a bit, if you recall. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Now, immediately, those that are not an in-depth Bible student will say, no, wait a minute. You just read where we're not supposed to fear. Now you read where we're supposed to fear. What is it? Well, the natural mind can't figure it out. And I know every Bible critic loves to jump on things like that. But our English language has one word, many cases that mean different things. And especially in the Greek and Hebrew, there may be other words that mean different things, but our English language only offers this one word. So in this case, it's not an exception to that. So when he says to fear me, and, and we are to fear God, that has to do with a reverential attitude toward God, that we reverence God. Uh, he has given us himself, and he dwells within us. He saved us from sin. He made our heart his home upon our regeneration. And now he's just told us he will never leave us. He will forsake not those that he has saved because he's going with us always. So therefore, the controlling motive of my life, spiritually, emotionally, morally, personally, is not a dread of him or a fear of him uh, a cautiousness of his wrath or his power or his judgment, but rather this holy reverence that I have for him will result in perfect love. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, perfect love casts out that old negative fear, but produces a love that is akin to that positive word, fear. So I don't want to displease God simply because I don't want to. 
no more than I would want to do something horrible to embarrass and humiliate my family sitting up yonder in that balcony or my wife over here sick in the bed. I don't want to do something that would discredit them. I don't want to do something that would hurt them. And I certainly don't want to do anything that would embarrass you as a church. I never will forget, you've heard me tell this story, being at the Marion Intermediate School years ago when the Bible bus arrived and I happened to be in the foyer there at the Intermediate School and all those little kids were piling off the Bible bus and others were going out, getting on and they were going and coming and I was standing there talking to Mr. Graybill at the time and this was years ago and several of the little children got to saying, oh, that's Preacher Mike, that's Preacher Mike, that's Preacher Mike, that's my, he's my preacher. And I told Bill Graybill, who was a preacher as well as a principal at Marion Intermediate School, I sure would hate to let those kids down. That's the kind of fear we're talking about when the Bible says fear God. I don't have to bite my fingernails and hunker down every time because he's not an abusive ogre. The lost world doesn't know God. So when they criticize him and judge him and say all kinds of evil about him, and wonder and worry, why does he allow suffering? Why does he allow injustice? They don't understand the God of this Bible. God is a loving father. He's not an angry ogre or some overpowerful deity that just wants to judge us and be mean to us all the time. If you know God, he is love. And the same chapter that says perfect love casts out fear also says that we love him because he first loved us. So that's a reverential fear of Almighty God. We respect Him and we love Him. And so therefore, naturally, as an extension of that love, we want to live right. That's what it means when it says fear God and keep His commandments. Remember Jesus said in John 15, I've not called you servants, I've called you friends. And you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So it's a natural sequence then. Once a repentant sinner becomes a child of God by repenting of our sins and trusting Christ and he then through the Holy Spirit makes our heart his home, he's going with us always and he's never going to forsake us. So therefore because of him, I fear him, I reverence him, I love him, I want to obey him, I want to please him, I want to be that which he ever lives to enable and empower me to be. So that's the first usage of fear in your Bible. Now the second is quite contrary, polar opposite. It is an, it is an intimidating fear resulting from adversaries. A reverential fear of, my, of the Almighty, that's one thing. But an intimidating fear of my adversaries, then that's another entirely. The reverential fear brings the positive elements of God himself, the fruit of the Spirit or the likeness of Christ, the conduct of Christ coming from my life because of the inner character of Christ. But... This old intimidating fear is not of the Holy Spirit, but of the human spirit. And it produces a numbness, a dulessness, a reluctancy, doubt, inferiority, and sometimes even terror. We get scared to death. Now, it's not physical fear like being afraid to get up and talk in front of people. Or something out here, you know, you're a little concerned about the dark. Somebody might be, you know, but I always tell people, ain't no difference in the dark and night. Everything's the same, just can't see it. My mother told me a story of my old mean Uncle Chuck. A lot of you remember old Chuck Lilly. He used to drink a lot of vodka, but he got saved in, in, right there on his deathbed, thank the Lord. Some of you smiling because you knew him. My mother said one time when she was scared when she was little, and Chuck never was afraid of anything. And they was going down a dark road one night and she was scared to death. Looked up Chuck, he just walked along, he wasn't concerned about anything. She said, ain't you afraid of boogers? He said, no. She said, why? I said, they can't see me in the dark. <laughs> Had a point, didn't he? <laughs> so there's natural fears, but we're talking about a fear that is produced by adversaries. And that's why the Lord said, Fear not. Don't be afraid of those things. 
don't allow your human spirit to take back operational, functional activity through your natural mind. You as a Christian, you stay spiritually minded and fear God, but don't fear the adversary because perfect love casts that fear out. Now, some things happen in this world that will agitate, frustrate, aggravate, terrorize. Some of us may be going through some things this morning and you don't know what you're going to do. Your foundation has been removed from your feet. Your equilibrium in your spirit has been disrupted and you're afraid. You might be like Ronnie. He waited on test results. They came back horrible. You may be waiting on a biopsy result and you can't hardly keep your mind on God this morning because of that event that's going on in your life. And a certain amount of concern is certainly justifiable even in the eyes of God. Cast your cares on me, said through the pen of Peter in 1 Peter 5, because I care for you. But what this word is, is, is allowing all these unnecessary forces of the storms of life to create a lot of unnecessary responses that are generated by the adversary, whosoever, whatsoever that adversary may be. Now we know, Peter said in the same chapter, 1 Peter 5, to be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He can't get your soul, dear fellow Christian, but the old God of this world is such a mental manipulator, he wants to agitate your mind and get you back into carnal-minded thinking. And then that improper thinking creates all these negative emotions. Proverbs 23, 7, I've quoted it countless times. As a person thinketh in their heart, so are they. So that fear that will numb you, that will cause you hesitancy, reluctancy, that fear that will even generate opposition to other people within you, jealousy, whatever old negative thing, that's why he's saying don't you be afraid of that. Because all of these old things are going to happen to us in this world. None of us are immune from it. One of the reasons why I feel personally is kind of sorry for my old daddy. I think he really thought he never was going to get old. Well, guess what? He did. And he thought, well, maybe I'm never going to have any trouble. Well, guess what? He did. And now he is. He's in the middle of it. But you don't have to be afraid of these things. Every one of us in here, including this feller standing in this pulpit, we're going to have tribulation and we're going to have trouble. But by all means, in the Lord's name, let us not be an ally with the adversary and create unnecessary havoc. Because when we get all fearful because of the stimulant and the stimuli of this old world, all these adversaries that happen, we are inevitably then going to forget God. And when we fail to forget not, then we're going to fail to fret not, and we're going to be filled up with fretting and forgetting and fearing because we simply get allowed to get placed out of our mind this truth that God said, I'll never forsake you. He's with you. In Matthew chapter 8, you don't have to turn over there, but it's... uh, Matthew chapter 8, Mark 4, and Luke 8, talking about storms and trials. The best uh, story, I think, in the life of Christ was when he was with them in and through and beyond the storm. Jesus is patient with us. Uh, He doesn't get aggravated at us, I don't think, uh, when we temporarily get all discombobulated. Sometimes you might get mad and say something you shouldn't say. Sometimes you may be overcome of of various things or either a, a triggering event or whatever. And sometimes like Paul, like Peter, Peter even cussed the name of the Lord at a crucial situation. Now you talk about stress, man. He was filled with stress. His very life was on the line. And so he made a mistake. Don't beat yourself up if you fall down now and again. Really the underlying lesson here is is not to be overcome. We may fall scripturally. 
but we're not going to be utterly cast down. He said, I won't forsake you. So when you, when you manifest a little humanity, don't let the devil tell you you're done, quit. You're not worthy. You tell that cat, let me tell you, the blood of Jesus makes me worthy. And I might have failed, but he doesn't. <laughs> I might have forgot about him, but he hadn't forgot about me. The grip is on his side, not mine. I've just laid my hand in his. He's got the grip. If I gripped his hand, I'd have slipped and fell a long time ago. But he's got mine. Do you get that lesson? So, Matthew 8, 26, Jesus asked a question. Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Did you hear that? Mark 4, 40. He asked another question, same story, just the different accounts from the, synop from the synoptic gospels here, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Matthew said, Jesus said, you had little faith. Mark said, no faith. I say, what's the difference? <laughs> Didn't have much faith. Luke 8, 35, he slept flat, asked him, where is your faith? So there's two big questions this morning under this not, fear not. Why are you afraid? Why are you intimidated? Why are you reluctant? Why are you thinking that there's no hope? Why are you thinking that America's in the mess and, it, and the mess it's in and it may not ever get straightened out? And I'm telling you, we are sure in a mess. And a bigger mess may be coming. But we're not of this world. We're in it. But we're not of it. But we've been called and sent into it. So I don't know what may happen tomorrow in this world. But I know who's going to be there with us. He said, where is your faith? Got faith in politicians? Got faith in yourself? Better not. Can't even trust the arm of the flesh. Not mine, not yours. No one's. We must trust the trustworthiness of God and depend upon the dependability of God. Now, those stories in Matthew 8, Mark 4, Luke 8, the ones that you've just seen on the screen, I think, and those questions of Jesus. He told them... He said there in Capernaum, let us go over to the other side. Now, how many times have you heard preachers preach? That's been preached so many times out of those four accounts in the gospel. Let's go over to the other side. Yes, when he said, let's go over to the other side, there's no way in the world that they were going to go under because Jesus said they were going under. But have you ever thought a little deeper about that thing? When Jesus said, let's go over. Now, over there in the Gospel of Mark, I believe chapter 14, he can, after he fed the 5,000, he constrained them to get in the ship and know, knew he was sending them into a storm. But he had expected them to learn something. <laughs> How long am I going to be a Christian before I start learning more about this man called Jesus? Instead of the just superficial thing that I get saved and then I start getting indoctrinated by denomination instead of continually being delivered by the deliverer and learn more about him. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And though he may not be the author of that storm, he will use that storm to make me and you stronger and more vividly aware of his capabilities that are limitless. As Jeremiah 32 says, they ain't nothing too hard for God. And after he taught them that, that lesson, life lesson in the storm, then he sent them out in there by, by themselves and they got scared to death again. But then he showed after he fed the 5,000, he went walking on the water to them. And you would have thought after they'd been with him enough, they would have recognized him. But they all looked out through that death and through that darkness and through the howling of that wind and said, who is that? I see something. That ain't a something. That's a somebody. <laughs> who is it? Finally, one of them said, well, it looks like the Lord. 
He must have been shining in the lightning. <laughs> Old Peter said, if that's you, bid me come to you on the water. Well, it's me, guys. You don't have to be afraid. Come on, Pete. <laughs> you got to hand it to old Simon Peter. He is the only one of the bunch that slung that leg out over that little Galilean fishing boat and got down on that water surface. And he is walking on the water as long as he's focused on Jesus. So there he was fearing Jesus. He was respecting Jesus. He was honoring Jesus. But then the wind got his attention. And the waves surely got his attention. Because he was looking at Jesus one time way up on top of that little watery mountain and that, it all gave way to a watery valley. And my goodness, he got overcome with fear. Instead of fearing the Savior, he started fearing the storm in those usages of those two words. So it was a reversal. He started out fearing the Lord, trusting the Lord. He was walking on water, had his eyes on Jesus, like Hebrews 12 said. But the waves and the wind got his attention. And so he transitioned from a spiritual mind walking miraculously on, the, on top of the elements, on top of the circumstances, they weren't sucking him down. He, like the old song used to say, when the waves are over my head, they're under his feet. But when the transition came from the spiritual mind to the natural mind, he forgot all about Jesus. Then he was on his own. And fear overtook him. Wouldn't me too, wouldn't it you? But Jesus reached out and got him, took him back to the boat teaching him another lesson. But was that lesson sufficient? Wasn't for the morning of crucifixion, was it? So don't beat yourself up. The teacher's always with you. And when you fail one quiz, he'll give you another one. Because he don't want to see you fail. He wants to see you succeed. We need to take our town for the gospel. We need to take this region for the gospel. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to set about resuming our dedication and taking this world for the gospel of the Son of God. Let's go over to the other side, guys. They went down to Capernaum and got in the boat. And they started over to the other side. Now you get this down in your heart before you leave God's house this morning. Before Jesus ever started out with them, he had absolute confidence in his own word. One of the greatest lessons that the young preacher Timothy learned in the pastoral epistles of 1 and 2 Timothy and the pastoral epistle of Titus was that Paul taught them that as Jesus lived earthly here in this world, he had faith in his own grace. He had confidence in his own power. Before he ever went to the cross... He said plainly without apology and boldly, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take it up again. Before he ever struggled beneath the weight of that cross, he knew he would rise again. Before he ever spun the planet as God, he knew he would die, but he knew he would rise again. And the resurrection spells ultimate hope even in the midst of ultimate despair. They were frightened beyond measure when Jesus died. They were hiding, afraid for their own life. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So before we ever entered into the valley of the shadow of death, in the mind of God, before he ever spun the planet in the beginning, we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. He had already said in the mind of God in the annals of eternity past, it's finished. And he already said that before he ever went to the cross. And before we ever get to that city, he's already declared it's done. And I ain't never going to forsake you, but I'm going to be with you. Let us go over to the other side. He knew they were going to arrive. Now with the mind of Christ, you know you're going to arrive too. With the natural mind of Adam, Ronnie, you'll say, I'm going to die. 
But with the mind of Christ, you declare, I am alive. To those of you here that are terminally ill or maybe watching on television in a hospital room, a nursing home, or they're at home and they've told you you only have a way or a short time to live and hospice is preparing, making you comfortable, you don't have to lay there and be afraid on that bad way because the world says you're dying. You can grin and hold the Bible up and say the word says, I am alive forevermore. I got news for you. All of our bodies are dying. There may be cancer coursing through me right now. There may be a little problem up here. I don't know. I talk to my old cell phone here all the time. I don't know if I got something in me or not. Might. I don't know, David. There may be blockages in my arteries, in my heart, my aorta. I might be gone from this world before. They may carry me out of church this morning. Dead or in a mackerel in the flesh, but in the spirit. Thank God we'll be at home. Fear not. We're going over to the other side. Everything was fine, and I hope everything is good and fine in your life. But, buddy, it could change real quick. Brother Randall, who in the world would have thought he went through what he thought? Who in the world know? I thought Ronnie was plum healed up there in Roanoke. I thought he'd never had no more trouble, and we'd have his 100th birthday. And now here we are again. Joanne, I always thought little Sonny would be healed. I always hold a hope for everybody, don't you? But we've all gone through things. And Carol, here you go again down through a trial. We're all going to have them. And Jesus had merely excused himself and went back into the stern, into the hinder part of the ship. And he laid down on a little bed and he manifested how human he was because he was so tired with the tossing of that little Galilean fishing boat. He is sound asleep. You may not see him, but he's nearby. You may not right now think that he's involved in your situation, but he's in your boat. (laughs) Fret not, forget not, fear not, because this man said, I will forsake not. Now, they reacted like all of us would. They forgot about him. And they saw the the water getting choppy. And they kept on going. They were too far out to turn back, too far out to make it. They just right there in the middle. (laughs) A little too far to get back and a little too far to get over. And there's when the storm comes. Something about storms, they know somehow when we're the most vulnerable. Young people this morning, when you're real strong, feeling good about yourself and God, somebody offer you some alcohol or some kind of drug, you just smile and say, no, thank you. But at the right time and the wrong place, The adversary will pick on you when you're vulnerable, not when you're victorious. He picks and chooses his moments. And when he sees life turning ugly or us in a vulnerable situation, it's when he'll unloose his ambush. And so they got concerned. They were seasoned fishermen. They knew that little Galilean fishing boat about at best 40 feet long, about 18 feet wide at best. Certainly wasn't designed or created or built to withstand hurricane force winds. They knew the mask was breaking. They knew the sails were all to pieces. They knew they heard the timber crack in the the middle of all the roaring of the waves and the wind. And so they looked at each other finally and said, boys, this is it. We're dying. And I don't know which one it was. Your guess is as good as mine. But one of them finally said, well, where's he at? Obviously, he's not here. Well, he doesn't care. One of them hollered. (laughs) Well, if he cared, he'd be out here. What about you caring about him? 
Do you expect Jesus and everybody else to cater to you? Sometimes we got to be smart enough, strong enough, man, woman enough, or young person enough to put ourselves in the right place. Especially at the wrong time out there on the bow to be struggling with that storm and getting overcome by it. Finally, they went back there into the hinder part of the ship and to their utter surprise, he just laid up there real comfortable, sound asleep. The man Jesus was with them, and he was human, but he's still God. Was he aware of their trouble? Sure. He's a very present help in trouble. But let me tell you something. It's too late if you get out there to a party and they're all drunk or monkeys doing everything in the world and you done lost your inhibition. It's a little bit too late, as Tanya Tucker said, to do the right thing now. I don't know where that come from. That went to somebody. You keep yourself out there. He's just a few feet away. Leave. If nothing else, leave. Well, they'll get mad at me. They're not your real friends anyhow. You better off fight them. And this goes to all of us as adults and everybody else. If you're in a bad situation, don't stay there. Get out of there. Run. You remember when little Potiphar's wife, as pretty as she was, I just imagine those black eyes, that black hair, and that olive skin. Little old Joseph, 16 years old, comes out of the shower, and there she stands, grinning. Parted her robe just a little bit, I'm sure. Joseph, a young man full of hormones. Don't tell me he wasn't tempted a little bit, but he didn't give the devil a chance. Turned that head and said, bye. He ran. (laughs) Get out of there. Run before it's too late. Don't stay in a vulnerable situation for the storm to overcome you and you get your natural mind all discombobulated. They revealed their heart when they finally said to Jesus, hey, we're dying and you don't care. Both of those were a lie. They were not dying. They had his word on it. And they ain't nobody cares like he cares. So he walks out through them. Didn't respond to them, obviously, from these four accounts. Didn't say nothing to them. Sometimes things are better showed than told. Sometimes when the Lord isn't speaking audibly, He's saying things that you can't live without learning. He walked right by him out onto the bow of the boat. You know the story well. He stretched out his arms. They're hunkered, holding, grabbing one another behind him, fighting for a stable stance. He said, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's he doing? And he stabilizes himself in the midst of that horrendous storm with 12-foot high waves and winds in excess of 75 miles an hour. The lightning flashes, lights up the scene. They see the blackened silhouette from the back of the Son of Man as he stretches out his hands. And they hear that voice of the transfigured Christ on Mount Transfiguration when he said, Peace! And that was louder than the roar of the waves and the slapping of the, of the roar of the waves and the, and the, and the, and the force of the wind. And all of a sudden, all of nature, everything just went to sleep. They hugged one another, said, What manner of man is this? Even the elements obey. And he who had just rebuked the dilemma turned around and rebuked his disciples. And he asked those two questions that you got on the screen Why are you afraid? They feared because they forgot. They failed to forget not and fret not because they forgot that he said, I'll forsake you not. Where's your faith? That was the million dollar question. Your faith got transferred off of me onto yourself. 
And the storm got way bigger than you real quick. And you were helpless and hopeless. But finally, you got me involved. I've really been involved all the time. You just didn't let me be the Lord of this situation. The storm got beyond you. But they ain't nothing or no one ever going to get beyond me. So fear not. Some of you this morning, you know what I'm talking about. You're in a storm. And it's hurting your heart. It's numbing your mind. Because you're afraid. The Lord said, fear not. Reverence Him. Trust Him. Love Him. Please be bold. Somebody said, well, I just haven't. Why is it that we won't read our Bibles? Why is it that we won't do the things that he tells us to do? Why do we refuse to trust God and then inevitably fail to rest in God? Why are we fretting when he says, fret not? Why are we forgetting when he says, forget not? Why are we fearing when he says, fear not? He's with us. How come you think you've made it this far? Because of Him. You say, well, I don't... There's no way in the world that I know what storm is raging in your life, but you and the Lord surely do. And I think of you that watch on Sunday night and you're there in a sick room with your loved one. Uh, I've been with many situations like that and... God bless you if you're doing that, tending to your loved one and hospice is there and, and this is an end of life, end of earthly life situation uh, for you that are there in the bed and you're listening to me and you're, you're watching this and you know uh, that your time here on this earth is very, very short. But can I just quickly say... You may still be here when old brother Mike's gone. I may have a massive heart attack here uh, right now in two seconds. Uh, we never know what our appointed time here may be. But don't look at the quantity, look at the quality. Uh, precious memories and the best is yet to come. And may God strengthen you that are standing by the bedside of that loved one there. Uh, if you're watching and you're feeling all alone, uh, no one there in the house with you, perhaps a recent death or some type of situation, divorce or whatever it is. And you just need to be reassured tonight that you are not alone. There's someone in the boat who can. We're out here on the, on the bow and we're fighting and we're arguing and we're stressed and we're terrified sometimes. And all the while, back yonder in the stern, the master of the sea is at the ready. He's at peace with his own word. He said, let's go over to the other side. I will never forsake you. Therefore, he who said, I will forsake not, we can say, I will fear not. I don't have to be overcome with all of these negative emotions of dread and just impending doom and all the rest of it. Because the Lord is faithful to his word. Uh, he puts his, we've read it in Psalms. He puts his word above his name. His word cannot be broken. So you've got his guarantee of grace that you are going to get through this thing because he is with you right there where you are. So I hope your heart will be comforted I hope your mind will be eased. And if you're not a Christian, that's the most important thing. Let the Lord save your soul. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this privilege and blessing of being with our viewers here on the television. And we ask, O oh God, that as you bless them, they will receive your blessings and apply those blessings to their lives. It ain't easy when the boats are rocking and breaking. 
and the waves are flying over just about to wash us over and, and the wind is a howling we can't even hear ourselves think and we get all confused and sometimes Lord we think that you don't care and we are dying but we ain't dying and you surely care and help us to solidify that fact in our mind to the bottom of our heart. And as we think in our hearts, so are we. So help us not to be being overcome, but help us to be overcomers. And may we know in the midst of the most horrendous storm that you are our peace. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Dear friend, to you, from heaven to your heart, peace and grace, and comfort, and love from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. May His peace and His comfort be real in your life, that you will know peace in the midst of the storm and victory in the midst of your battle. Thanks for being with us tonight. Remember, March 15th and 16th, Saturday and Sunday, or April 15th and 16th, Saturday and Sunday, uh, does He hear me? He hears you, I promise you. And you'll see all about that in this year's Easter drama here at Freedom. And we invite you to be here. Put it on your calendar, pastors, youth pastors, senior pastors, everyone, family groups. Just come on and be with us. And we're going to celebrate the resurrection here on Freedom Ridge this Easter 2017. Put it on your calendar and plan to be here with us. We invite all of you. Thank you for helping us here in this facility over the past seven and a half years. We're coming down to the end now, but still we've got things to finish up. So let's finish well. Everybody now, all of us working together like we have, let's get it all finished up. This is all for our community and our region and everybody. And let me say as we go off the air to all the pastors who were here for the dedication, I'm sorry I wasn't able to shake all of your hands and hug all of your necks, but I was humbled and so blessed to see so many of God's preachers here from the wall to wall. Uh, you guys lined it up and you encouraged us. You're holding our hands up. And now with the ongoing ministries of Camp Freedom and all that we do here, let's just see what God has in mind over the days to come. You're not laboring in vain. You're not sowing in infertile soil. To God be the glory as we labor together with Him for the glory of His marvelous gospel. Thanks for being there tonight. We appreciate it. Remember all this week, fear not because God said I'll forsake not. So we don't have to uh, fret. We can fret not. We can forget not. And we can fear not. And we'll get another not next week. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Till next time, may God bless you richly. Then may he use you for his glory and to be a real blessing to someone else.